Tonight, our presentation is Cuba, and our speaker is Dr. George Dominguez. Dr. Dominguez is the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico at Harvard University and Chair of the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. From 2006 to 2015, he served at Harvard's first Vice Provost for International Affairs in the Office of the Provost and Senior Advisor for International Studies to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I'm out of breath from running up the stairs. <sighs> from 1995 to 2006, he served as director of Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, once described by Foreign Affairs as the Dean of U.S. Cubanologists, Dr. Dominguez has published various books and articles on Latin America, and in particular, Cuba. He is also an associate of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin Studies and of Leverett House. Dr. Dominguez received his BA from Yale University and his MA and PhD from Harvard University. At Yale, he was a prominent leader in the Yale Political Union. He began his teaching career at Harvard in 1972, and by 1979 was a full professor. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. George Dominguez. George? Thank you, George. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you this evening. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad to be able to uh, see all of you here. Um, my uh, purpose this evening is to chat with you uh, about Cuba, particularly what goes on inside the country. Uh, during my remarks, I will uh, have only maybe a couple of things to say about U.S.-Cuban relations, but during the question and discussion period, I'd be happy to address any questions that you may have on, on any of these related topics. So Cuba is changing in one significant way. Uh, a bit over a year ago, at the age of 91, Fidel Castro died. He had governed Cuba since 1959. Uh, and in April, uh, just a few weeks from now, Raul Castro, on the eve of his 87th birthday, uh, will step down as President of the Council of State and President of the Council of Ministers. Uh, it's not yet clear, and it probably will not be absolutely clear until April, who the next President of Cuba will be. But particularly events over the last, uh, and Cuban media coverage uh, over the last um, month, six weeks or so, suggests that the person who has been uh, Cuba's first vice president, a man by the name of Miguel Diaz-Canel, born in 1960, uh, will be, uh, or is most likely to be, the next uh, president of Cuba. As you can see, from age 87 uh, to, uh, to from Raul Castro, born in 1931, to Miguel Diaz-Canel, born in 1960, a 29-year difference, uh, is a fairly substantial generational change. It also means that the next president of Cuba had no experience whatsoever on what Cuba looked like or was or felt like uh, before Fidel Castro uh, uh, seized power. So it, it's, it's, it's not a minor change. It's not entirely clear uh, what it will mean, but let me try to spend the next uh, few minutes. Let me also get a, my watch out so I uh, do not... Uh, uh, talk longer than I should. Let me spend the next few minutes trying to tell you what is the Cuba the new president will find and the new team that this new president may well put together. Some of it is in place, some of it uh, yet to be found. So one way to begin, having just made reference to the ages of Fidel Raul Castro and Miguel Diaz-Canel, is with Cuba's demography. It's an odd way to begin perhaps a conversation, but demographers and the work that they do is one way to help us look over a long period of time uh, that reduces uh, elements of guesswork. So Cuba has been below the demographic replacement rate 
since 1978. Or, to make the point more generally, uh, not enough kids are born to replace those who pass on. Therefore, uh, if you ever have thought of demography and have heard the expression of population pyramid, that means relatively few elderly, lots of kids, lots in the middle. Cuba has an inverted pyramid. The age of the median Cuban is now between 40 and 45. It is a rapidly aging population. It has the age structure of an industrialized society in Western Europe or in Japan. But of course it doesn't have the economic basis of Western Europe and Japan. Given who these Cuban leaders are and the fact that some of them, like Raul Castro and many others, have been governed in Cuba for over a half century, some of the decisions they now face are decisions that they find very difficult to take. They have to shut down primary schools. Two years ago, the Minister of Education gave a long defense of keeping open a school that had only one student. It's not a very good use of the resources of a country that does not have money to spare. They have to shut down pediatrics. They have to open up geriatrics. They have to close down schools. They have to think of housing for the elderly. They have what could only be described as a gigantic pension liability because they don't really have a working pension system for a rapidly aging population. This is a real problem. No matter how you look at it, there's another way to look at the makings of this problem. I, I don't want to minimize the problem, but to take the next step. Why below the demographic replacement rate since 1978? Why did the number of kids per woman, median woman age 45 go down? The answer, in fact, is not mysterious. It's for exactly the same reason as that phenomenon happens the world over. To educate girls and they will start taking care of their reproductive lives. Cuba has a highly educated population, men and women. There are more women at the University of Havana than there are men. There are more women in most careers at the University of Havana than there are men in those careers. A highly educated population and these women prefer and have the ways to have much smaller families. It has also occurred that life expectancy has lengthened. Cubans die for the same reasons we will. It is, you know, diseases of circulatory system of the heart, um, cancers, and accidents. Many fewer kids. Uh, much harder to pay for the expenses of the elderly, but it also tells you, and the explanation about well-educated uh, girls, women, to take charge of their lives, is the two accomplishments uh, of this Cuban government over the past half century are a very good educational system and a very good, now beginning to fray, but still for basic purposes, very good health care system. That makes it easier to have fewer kids and to educate them well. It makes it easier for people my generation to live to the age that we now get. Uh, and to do so not only in the United States, Europe and Japan, but to do so in Cuba as well. These are in and of themselves in education and health care very good policies of the Cuban government very well implemented over a period of time. They also, not surprisingly, are at the core of the political support that this Cuban government has. It's very difficult to know how much genuine support this government has, but among the most interesting examples of public opinion polling, uh, most public opinion polling done in Cuba is not reliable. Some of it is, 
Let me give you an example just of one public opinion poll and why I find it useful. This pollster managed to ask a random sample of Cubans what they thought about the availability of public transportation. Terrible. The adequacy of the food supply. Terrible. Terrible. The variety of products available for purchase in a store, awful. It's an impressive list of negative judgments. Remember, they were not asking, what do you think about communism? What do you think about the president's performance? That would make a survey useless in Cuba today. But if you're asking about specific services, specific things that are very concrete, you do get good answers. And in that way, when you ask them about health care and education, enormously positive. So it's a discerning public. They know what does not work or what works very badly. And they are prepared to say it even to a complete stranger who's a pollster. And therefore, I believe them when they tell me that the schools that their kids and grandkids attend do a good job and that when grandma has to be taken to the emergency room in the hospital, she would be treated effectively and with respect. These are the good things. To stay with my demographic story, the decline in fertility rate is not, however, just a function of educating girls and making sure that uh, families are confident that their kids will survive childbirth in the early years and go on because health care uh, is good. It is also, sadly, a consequence of very bad economic performance. And among the reasons parents choose not to have kids is they lose hope in the future. So one way to begin is with poverty. Officially, the Cuban government tells us there's no poverty in Cuba. That's nonsense. Uh, so working with a group of colleagues at the University of Havana, a combination of economists and anthropologists, constructed an index, which in order not to get these colleagues into trouble, we call it population at risk. You and I can call it poverty. Uh, in order to be classified following this procedure as a poor person, you must meet each of four different criteria. You have to meet all four to be called poor. First, your salary um, converted into U.S. dollars is one U.S. dollar per week. One U.S. dollar per week. Those of you who follow World Bank definitions of poverty, the World Bank long ago defined it as a dollar a day. World Bank now typically defines it as two dollars a day. This is one dollar a week. Secondly, you do not eat uh, your midday meal in a state subsidized cafeteria where you could eat a lot and therefore you could save whatever it is to feed your family in the evening. So you don't have that kind of subsidy. Thirdly, you do not grow your own food. So by definition, uh, this index says there are no poor in the Cuban countryside. There are no rural poor. That, of course, is not true, but for the sake of this construction, uh, it is easier to do it this way. That means you do not have a backyard where you can grow vegetables. That means you do not have a, you know, a strip of land between you and your neighbor. You, there's no urban farming. Uh, in your experience or in your household. Fourthly, you do not have uh, income in U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars or euros. Uh, that is to say, you do not receive remittances from a friend or a relative in Florida or in Mexico or in Spain, and you do not yourself work in the tourism sector, so you do not get tips in hard currencies. You meet all four. One out of every five Cubans is poor. Chances are, if you work through uh, my four criteria, that you and I might agree, well, even if I just meet a couple of those, I'm in terrible shape. And in fact, 
probably about half of Cubans, live under circumstances that are reasonably called serious hardship. The median salary uh, is approximately a dollar a day for the population as a whole, uh, about a dollar a day. Uh, among uh, the highest paid um, persons, um, the income of the best well-trained um, surgeon is about $200 a month. Same for an athlete who competes on Cuba's behalf in the Olympics. These are very low salary incomes, and that's also why things like remittances and tips uh, in the tourism sector become important. Moving beyond poverty, the Cuban economy uh, has performed quite badly. <coughs> Cuban national account statistics do not follow the worldwide United Nations system. It is very difficult to compare them to other countries. And uh, but one, but I can characterize it uh, for you in the following sense. Cuban gross domestic product, which is characteristically the widest measure of economic output in a society, is almost certainly still below the mid-1980s. Cuban economy's last good quarter uh, of sustained economic growth was the last quarter of calendar year 1985. It has had ups and downs ever since, but it has not yet returned in real terms to the level that it had in the mid-1980s. Cuban economic growth rate during Raul Castro's presidency, 10-year presidency, 2008-2018, uh, uh, is probably zero. It may be as high, depending on how one looks at it, uh, as about 1% per year. It was negative last year, even by the official statistics. Now you begin to see how what I was saying about demographics begins to connect with the economy. What then, let me stay now a little longer on the economy. Uh, what might explain this catastrophic performance over a third of a century uh, with regard to the economy. It doesn't begin, it began in mistakes made in governing the economy in Cuba by the Cuban leadership, but it, the biggest shock, the most dramatic one, is the collapse of the Soviet Union, which had, we now, we had always known that it was important, now know much more clearly, had uh, extraordinarily uh, subsidized the Cuban economy and had paid for uh, a variety of Cuba's policies, whether it's in the development of the armed forces or the health care and educational establishment that I've described briefly for you. That is the big shock. But that shock reverberates in other ways, not all of which are connected to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Chances are that at least some of you in the room would know that Cuba uh, used to be known as a significant producer of sugar cane and uh, sugar specifically, as well as associated products that come from uh, sugar cane. Cuba in the late 1980s, on any given year, used to produce somewhat over 8 million metric tons of sugar. Cuba in the harvest currently underway, this is harvest season, um, harvest currently underway will be lucky to produce as much as one and a half billion metric tons of sugar. Over eight, one and a half. It is a catastrophic decline of the sugar industry, the mothballing of about four out of every five Cuban sugar mills. Cuban agriculture, more generally, not just in sugar, is stagnant has been stagnant for a long time. Uh, that is why Cuba, in the course of this century, in a program that was authorized by <coughs> President George W. Bush, uh, Cuba has been importing agricultural products from the United States. Uh, it has imported at about 
five and a half billion dollars from the United States in agricultural products, but also including poultry. Uh, chances are, if one of you or one of your friends has eaten at a private restaurant in Havana uh, the, and ordered chicken, that chicken comes from Iowa, not from Cuba. Uh, terrible performance in, in agriculture. If you turn to manufacturing, Cuba has by far the best, the highest quality manufacturing technology of the 1950s. Uh, it not only is it incapable of exporting manufactured products, uh, but it has difficulty supplying even the normal uh, operations of the domestic economy well before you start thinking about competing in uh, simple industrial exports, which is what many countries uh, at a low level of development uh, have done uh, long ago in East Asia, more recently in India, uh, and in some African countries. Cuba doesn't have the capacity to do that. How then has the Cuban government responded to this uh, sustained, severe economic challenge uh, that inflicts hardship on a large number of Cubans and severe hardship on at least one out of five? So beginning gingerly in the early 1990s and picking up speed under Raul Castro's presidency and particularly during the course of the current decade, uh, Cuba has begun to open up uh, certain sectors of its economy. Uh, now, uh, one of Cuba's top two sources of uh, income generating activities is tourism. Calendar year 2017, the numbers are still preliminary, but the number of international visitors uh, will be not less than four and a half million and perhaps four and three quarter millions. The number of international visitors in 1990 was below 20,000. This is a, a new uh, tourism industry. Uh, it has grown very quickly and it has grown particularly fast during this century. In calendar year 2017, again, the final numbers are not yet in. The number of visitors from the United States to Cuba exceeded 900,000, approximately one-third uh, Cuban-Americans, but approximately 600,000 or so who have no particular national origin affinity uh, for Cuba. Tourism was one response to permit first and then to stimulate and develop the tourism industry. The second largest source of revenue is the Cuban government exports uh, professional services, primarily health care services. So for the last um, 15 years or so, Cuba has deployed approximately, had been deploying approximately 30,000 health care personnel physicians, nurses, technicians to Venezuela as a way to pay for imported petroleum from Venezuela. The two, this was really a barter relationship. Then the two central banks monetized the barter. This is the cost of the physician. This is the cost of a barrel of oil. These are the volumes uh, to try to get them uh, to clear. Cuba then began to export uh, not only health care but other services. Um, uh, sports trainers, uh, school teachers, uh, bodyguards for political leaders, advisors for intelligence services to a variety of countries across the world. Venezuela remains uh, at the top, uh, but other clients, uh, significant clients have included, for some, not necessarily for all of these lines of activity, have included um, Brazil, South Africa, and Angola, and a few other uh, smaller countries. Uh, this is uh, carried out by Cuban state enterprises that employs these professionals and they provide these services. There's also a hybrid of these two topics, uh, healthcare tourism in Cuba, so someone travels from another country to Cuba and it pays in hard currency, receives medical services and have in a hospital. So tourism is a new line of activity, export of professional services is another line of activity. A third line 
of activity is to first permit and then encourage sending remittances. Uh, anyone can send remittances. They, uh, relatives, of course, do so the most, but it could be friends, it could be anybody else. Very difficult to estimate what is the volume of remittances. Um, my conservative estimate is that is that it has been about a billion a year. Uh, U.S. Embassy in Havana had estimated it at two billion, uh, but it is approximately in that range. If it is two billion, and it is perfectly possible that it is, as I said, my own estimate is very conservative. Uh, that is just below the value of all of Cuba's exports in goods. So it's a small economy, and so if you get two billion in remittances and you only export about two and a half billion in goods, uh, this is not counting tourism, not counting export of professional service in goods, um, it makes a very big difference. Agriculture, I said, was one of Cuba's uh, uh, significant problems. And so the Cuban government, realizing that state farms were unproductive, badly run, uh, simply were not doing what they were supposed to be doing, begun to allow workers on state farms to uh, cultivate uh, the land uh, that still belongs to the state, but now can be run by these uh, agricultural workers turned into farmers. All of these are positive steps. The one that probably has made the most difference and that has economic, social, and in due course, not yet, will have political consequences uh, is known um, uh, in Spanish as trabajo por cuenta propia or self-employment. Uh, but the way to think about it is the authorization of small private businesses. Cuban government, a little bit of the starting in the beginning of the 90s, but particularly under President Raul Castro during the course of this decade, uh, now gives licenses to people to do a variety of things. Uh, it has issued uh, a number varies, obviously, from year to year, uh, sometimes from month to month but about 500 to 550,000 of these licenses. Cuba has a population of 11.2 million people. Uh, estimates of, again, my colleagues is that for any one license, there's about four people working there because I, the licensee, I'm authorized by the license to hire other people who need not be relatives. They could be regular workers. That would imply that two million Cubans uh, out of a total population, obviously including kids as well as the uh, old old uh, of 11.2 million, but 2 million Cubans are in the private sector. This is a very big change. Uh, Cuba had gone from uh, the early 1960s uh, to the early 1990s basically with uh, none of this kind of activity. You needed a plumber, you needed to call a state plumbing exercise. And at one point, I was able to find that if you had a broken toilet, the average wait was three months. Uh, so now to be able to call a private plumber who would come at a more reasonable schedule uh, is a significant improvement. Uh, for those, and there may be some of you in the room who might have traveled to Cuba, perhaps the most visible example of this new private economic activity is in private restaurants. I used to say to people, don't go to Cuba for the food. You want good Cuban food, go to Miami, go to New York, but don't go to Havana. Now, in fact, in these paladares, as these private restaurants are called, there is good Cuban food, and they have created a chain of private sector activity that goes from a private farmer growing vegetables and other things to serve on the table all the way to those who connect to the tourists and the like, and it is a significant volume of economic activity. What are some of the problems with these innovations? Take the agricultural worker who had been working on a state farm and now is told by the state farm, oh, you can go grow whatever you would like uh, here. It's just fine. Problem. Uh, under the uh, 
contract, which is called in Spanish usufructo, usufructo. Uh, you have the right to work the land, but for 10 years. And any substantial material improvement you put on the land, suppose you build a small house, suppose you build whatever, a barn. At the end of the 10 years, everything returns to the state. This doesn't all of a sudden look like such a good idea. Cuba and Cuban farmers have been familiar over time with growing perennial crops. It's not that they could not grow annual crops, but many of them, the way they grew up, the kinds of jobs they learned from their grandparents who had been workers in the countryside, is you plant, you let it grow, and then perennials will keep coming back. Well, that implies a time horizon that goes well beyond 10 years. The incentives to do your best uh, in these private farms are less, or if you really are going to do it, you better work only on those kinds of things on which you can get a reasonably quick return. You're not investing for the long term. You're not developing what in the U.S. we might call agribusiness. Export of health care. Uh, uh, services. So the physicians and the nurses who go to Brazil, who go to Venezuela, and whatever. Cuba has multiple exchange rates uh, that operate in the country, not just for tourists, but internally. Cuba has also confiscatory tax rates. Working with Cuban economists, uh, the goal was to try to calculate the real effective tax rate. That includes the tax rate that people actually have to work with, minus whatever deductions are possible, uh, but also taking into account the differentials of the exchange rate. The effective real tax rate on a healthcare physician or a nurse working abroad is 94%. 94 so suppose you are a family doctor, a, a very competent, well-trained general practitioner. And suppose the Brazilians price your services at $100,000. You're worth much more than that, but just the arithmetic is easier. You get to keep $6,000. The government gets the rest. But this is why the arithmetic is helpful. I told you a few minutes ago that a surgeon would earn 200 a month, 6,000 a year is more than double. So you volunteer to go, even though you're exposed to this very, very high uh, rate of taxation. The problem is that with this scheme, you're also creating an incentive for the nurse, for the physician, for the healthcare technician to defect. And so every week, Somewhere in the world, uh, as many as 10 Cuban healthcare personnel decide, hey, I'm not going to put up with this. And chances are that if they, the longer they retain this way of compensating their most highly trained people, of whom they should be the proudest, the greater the difficulty they will have. That also explains why Cuban baseball players play on the major leagues. They, you know, they wanted to be able to earn more money. So on the question of the private economy, the private sector, the government figured on its own that once you create a set of private businesses that can operate, that can make money, that can begin to donate funds to civic groups, that had not been created by the government, that can begin to support uh, um, uh, the synagogue in Havana, that can begin to support uh, the local Roman Catholic Church, uh, or the growing group of evangelicals, that can do any number of these other activities outside the realm of the economy, but not authorized, not controlled by the Communist Party. Hey! What had seemed like a simple market liberalization begins to look like 
it may have political effects. So beginning about a year ago, the government froze the issuing of new licenses. No more new licenses. In some areas, but very few, they've revoked existing licenses, so they have put new obstacles on the existing licenses. But for the most part, they are standing back and waiting to see uh, what lies ahead. And the what lies ahead includes, to some extent, who will be the next president of Cuba. They will know this in April. Uh, but they also are trying to figure out what will happen in U.S.-Cuban relations. There is one specific aspect of the change in U.S.-Cuban relations that bears on the small private sector. The most successful parts of the small private sector connect directly with the international tourism. That is to say, a visitor who comes and chooses not to stay at a state hotel, but stays at Airbnb. Airbnb is the Airbnb and the airlines are the two most successful U.S. businesses operating in Cuba over the past uh, two, uh, two to three years. So you stay at an Airbnb, and that is a private business, and you're paying the people who run it, and you're paying the people who sell the food to, for breakfast there, or if you have other meals. Uh, you then go out to other meals to the paladares, the private restaurants. You avoid, if you have any takeaway from tonight, please, please avoid state cafeterias. Don't go there. Uh, but what you see is the chain of activity. Then you decide, then you decide that you've seen these gorgeous 1955 uh, uh, Chevys on the street and you want to ride one, but you're not quite sure you can ride the streets of Havana, so you rent a 1955 Chevy and hire a driver to take you around. And if you go around, what you would find, as I have, because I, I, I was trying to understand uh, this type of business, my driver, this is about a year ago when I did this, is a mechanical engineer. And I said, oh, you used to be a mechanical engineer. He was slightly offended. I am a mechanical engineer. Well, but isn't this now your business? Don't you drive around? No, 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 no. I'm a mechanical engineer from Monday to Friday. And then on the weekends, I drive people like you who hire me to take them around the city. And I earn three times as much driving a car than I do as a mechanical engineer. I love being a mechanical engineer. That's why I do it. But I have a family, I have children, I have grandchildren, and so I need to be a tourism driver. What has happened is the government has authorized licenses for those kinds of private business activities that require the lowest levels of education. So now you're a high school dropout and you make much more money than someone who went to the university, became an engineer, became a physician, became a whatever. The incentive system is turned upside down. If you're a smart kid and want to make money, don't go to the university. If you just love being a mechanical engineer, it's okay. Go to the university, become a mechanical engineer. But make sure you get to drive tourists on Sunday. These are the issues that constrain the Cuban economy. Here's where if the US policy remains one of discouraging visits to Cuba, the main injury, which I think is not at all what President Trump intended, uh, the main injury is to the private sector. The people that the President has said in his one and only speech in Cuba, he most wanted to help. Because if your clients aren't coming, the Airbnb, the restaurants, uh, the car repairs and the car driving, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. The last of the reforms, I, I better be winding up, uh, uh, last of the reforms that is problematic is remittances. So, you don't send, you can send remittances by Western Union, there are a number of things, but for the most part, most of the remittances go in cash in a suitcase. 
it isn't just the witnesses. Now, at one point, uh, uh, you know, I have research activities in Cuba. We have students who go study abroad at the University of Havana for a semester. Uh, they have to pay low tuition, but they have to pay tuition. And so we tried to open a bank account at a Cuban state bank. After four years of trying, we've given up. And so once a year, we have a staff member who, in suitcases, uh, takes $100,000 to Cuba in cash. Cuban and U.S. co-conspiracy not to regulate the flow of funds is a spectacular invitation if you want to be a serious money launderer. And the prices of Cuban real estate, now that the government has allowed the sale of uh, a home that you may own, the prices of Cuban real estate are beginning to rise in a way that suggests that there is, in fact, money laundering going on in this way. So while those set of reforms are good reforms, each of them has uh, some aspect of it that is deeply problematic. Let me very quickly say, if I have more time, I say the social policies I'll just highlight. So the healthcare system, though it remains for the most part a very good healthcare system, now has begun to open to petty corruption. So if grandma really needs to have an operation in the hospital uh, and she really shouldn't be waiting six months, um, I bribe uh, someone to let her in quickly. The bribes are typically small. A bottle of rum would do. But that had not happened in the past. The quality of high school education has begun to suffer because many of the high school teachers now have quit to enter the private sector small as it is, menial as it is in many ways, but it pays more than being a high school teacher. And therefore, parents have begun to hire private tutors to prep their kids for the exams to enter the university. And tutors are the most sophisticated category of licenses that the government has permitted. So any one of us can tutor someone in math can tutor someone in English. The idea is that uh, this is remedial work, so it is not as complex as a teacher would undertake. But in fact, when tutors get together, what you begin to see, this is especially with regard to instruction in foreign languages, is there now are private schools in Havana for foreign languages. And this is totally different. There had been none such before 2010. To wind up, I want to move briefly into politics, but then wind up to make sure that you have time for questions. Um, among the things less well reported uh, outside of Cuba, and to some extent uh, in Cuba, is liberalizing steps that Raul Castro took as president that have made a real difference in the lives of human beings. Let me give you uh, just two or three examples. There's more, but again, I, I'm now, I realize I'm somewhat pressed for time. Um, one uh, is there had been under Fidel Castro the requirement that all kids had to go to boarding school. And the purpose of this was to take the kids out of mom and dad and grandparents and put them uh, in the kinds of schools where the state would really take charge of their education uh, at the middle school level uh, in particular, but also uh, senior high school to some extent, uh, in order to shape future quote-unquote revolutionary citizens. Raul Castro said, no, that mandatory requirement ends and now we'll keep the boarding schools open if uh, parents and kids uh, want to want to go there, but uh, if you want your kid to study in your home, that's just fine. And the number of kids in boarding school almost overnight plummeted by 82 percent. Parents and grandparents, for the most part, like to have their kids around, not surprisingly. But the fact that now there was choice restored at the part of the family 
is probably one of the things for which ordinary Cuban adults now thank Raul Castro. Raul Castro, let me emphasize, did not have the reputation as a liberalizer. Raul Castro's professional performance until the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s was of a very hard liner. Uh, but he is one of those Cuban leaders uh, who at around the age of 60 really does seem to have changed his mind. I mentioned this as a preamble to my next example. In the middle of the 1960s, the Cuban government opened uh, units, uh, acronym in Spanish is UMAP, uh, military units for aid to production, to which, quote unquote, deviants were sent. And so they would round up anyone who either was gay or was suspected of being gay, and they were sent there. The UMAP did not just have uh, uh, gays, uh, uh, religious believers uh, 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 were sent as well, but it was mainly for gays. The idea that you're going to be congregating a whole bunch of men under military command uh, to turn them in that context into heterosexuals, it is either to laugh or cry or both at the same time. That somehow never struck me as a good way to transform uh, 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 sexual orientation. Uh, this was cruel. The only published example I ever saw of a military court martial was of military officials in charge of these awful concentration camps. The commander-in-chief was Raul Castro. Today, one of Raul Castro's uh, daughters, Mariela Castro, is a public advocate for gays in Cuba, uh, making clear in public that being gay is not a crime under the laws of the Republic of Cuba nor is it an aggravating circumstance if for some reason you are caught stealing a pair of shoes. Under her father's authority, uh, she has brought in police officers from Canada and the United Kingdom to train the police of Havana about how it is that they should behave in the event that they have to arrest someone who is gay. How to make sure that they understand the rights that someone who is gay is and should have uh, under all circumstances, uh, certainly if there's absolutely not the slightest hint of any crime whatsoever. This is a very different Raul Castro, uh, and it clearly makes a very significant difference for anyone under those circumstances. The Cuban government under Fidel Castro was systematically homophobic. In 1980, it deported people simply because of their sexual orientation. During the HIV crisis, the response of the Cuban government was to imprison you uh, and to prevent you from going back to your family or going back to work uh, and the like. Uh, there's a whole array of procedures of this sort, and so this is a very significant change. Under Raul Castro, the death penalty has not been applied at all. Under Fidel Castro, it was applied a great deal, brutally at times. The number of political prisoners in Cuba is a subject of intense debate. If one defines, and, and it, it depends on how one tries to be precise about it, if one defines it as a prisoner of conscience, here I am, I can do no other, my only crime is I'm trying to express my ideas to or, or associate with others who are like-minded in order to advance a vision for the future of Cuba. That's a prisoner of conscience. That's what Amnesty International focuses on. And according to Amnesty International, there's none of those in Cuba today, and there has been none now for several years. It's not, however, the only category of political prison. There are people who get arrested on some pretext. Uh, a lot of what Cubans ordinarily consume, they buy in illegal markets. That's done by government officials or members of the Communist Party. But you're breaking the law. And so you don't go and arrest the Communist Party official, but you go arrest the political dissident uh, under that charge, but the real motivation is a political crime. If you count those as political prisoners, the number it has been during the Raul Castro presidency, a low three-digit number. Think between 100 and 300. 
the Cuban government under Raul Castro has done is to move away from death penalty and political imprisonment of both types of political imprisonment and instead go for arrests. So a group walks down the street and marches. So there's a group of women who do so uh, on a regular basis. They are arrested for a few hours, a couple of days, and then released. Uh, the number of arrests vary between 500 and 1,000 per month. This is a much less harsh, much more subtle way of exercising repression. There's no doubt that it is repression, but it is an example of a change. This is an authoritarian regime. It remains an authoritarian regime, but it has modulated its approach. Back to politics and to conclude. Um, in addition to the president of Cuba, uh, the key group uh, uh, that governs the country is the political bureau of the Cuban Communist Party. Cuba has the same type of political structure that those of you who might be familiar with communist regimes in China, or the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union, the former communist countries of Europe would know. The political bureau has 17 members. Of those 17, eight, roughly half, were born before 1945. One of the things the Cuban leadership has not done well and had not done at all is to plan for a normal process of succession. If they really care about sustaining their political regime, they needed new leaders. And they've been amazingly slow. Up until a year and a half ago, uh, the, uh, of the 17 know. members, four the, among the four in the younger group were added uh, a year and a half ago. It meant that on you had the eight before 1945, and then only um, uh, five others. They, they just simply had not, those who had been in power for so long were completely unprepared and unwilling to give it up. One of the doubts about what will happen in the months ahead is whether not just Raul Castro, but other of the members of this leadership will choose to step down. The interesting feature is that uh, we will be able to look at uh, a Cuban National Assembly election, the Cuban Parliament. Formerly, the president of Cuba is chosen by the parliament. It's not a direct election. Cuban National Assembly elections are the sort of elections that politicians love in any part of the world. The number of seats to be filled is equal to the number of candidates. You win. Uh, what is interesting is, for reasons that have never been entirely clear to me, the Cuban government gives voters three uh, other choices besides ratifying. So the, what the government wants you to do is to vote for everyone who appears on the ballot. And candidates are clustered in districts, so uh, a district would have anywhere between two and five candidates to fill between two and five seats. Everybody wins. But by doing it this way, though they want you to vote for everyone in front of, uh, the, whose name appears on the ballot, you can do three other things. You can vote blank, you can annul the ballot, or you can vote selectively. You can vote for candidate A, but not for candidate B. Suppose the rules of the last National Assembly election in 2013 had stipulated that the candidate with the fewest votes would be defeated. Oh, an unreasonable thing uh, in democratic countries, of course. That's the way we do it. Suppose they had had that rule. If so, one third of the political bureau would have been defeated in the election. Among the reasons the Cuban government doesn't want to change the rules, doesn't look good. If you've had an economy in stagnation for 10 years, if you're not yet back to the level of economic activity of 1985, if you are governed 
by a generation whose time really now has passed. They should have, they should have passed on to successors. This is a leadership that is afraid of its people. And yet their willingness to make adjustments is remarkably, remarkably little. So the last Communist Party Congress, a year and a half ago, there were some, it's about a thousand people, <clears throat> there was some debate, people would stand up in a commission saying that the party platform, the, the, the program of the party, should <coughs> excuse me, stipulate that every Cuban has a right to uh, information and access to the internet. Not surprisingly, it was defeated. Another one stood up and said, um, every Cuban should have uh, the right to form civil society organizations and the Communist Party should not try to manipulate it but should try to guarantee it. Ha! Huh. No, it got defeated as well. Third proposal, uh, this one carried, was proposed by someone named Fidel Castro and it was to encourage and promote foreign direct investment in Cuba. It's not the Fidel Castro you might be thinking about, it's his son. So, freedom of information, internet, no. Uh, civil society, associations, no. Foreign investment, yes. The fourth uh, proposal I just simply want to mention was someone uh, said that we should modify the formal Communist Party slogan. Communist Party cares about slogans. Uh, it's, it's something bizarre about Communist Party slogan. The official slogan had been the Communist Party stood for a Cuba that was sovereign, independent, um, socialist, and sustainable. Sustainable list because they're beginning to take environmental concerns serious. The motion was that next to the word socialist, it should say democratic. Ah, shot down. The slogan remained the same, no word democratic, until a few weeks later in a major speech, sort of the equivalent of the State of the Nation, Raul Castro said, and I want to conclude my speech with the slogan of the Cuban Communist Party. We stand, and I particularly stand, in favor of a Cuba that is sovereign, independent, socialist, democratic, and sustained. So it supports democracy by undemocratic means. Presidential decision against the majority of the party Congress. That's the Cuba the new leadership will face. Thank you. Questions? Did anybody figure out what was going on at the uh, embassy in Cuba as far as uh, whether they were bombarding it with radio waves or what was the problem there? So, um, two answers. One is short, one is a little longer. Short answer, no. No, no one has figured it out. Uh, longer answer, um, what well, we do, what, what the FBI has now ascertained is that the original character, characterization of sonic attacks is inaccurate. Uh, physics is not going to take you to sonic attacks. So what the FBI now seems to be uh, investigating is some biological agent, biochemical agent. Uh, but it, it remains very much, it's an investigation still under progress. Uh, one interesting feature of the investigation is that the Cuban government has invited the FBI to go to Havana. Uh, they have done so four times. The FBI had not been to Havana since 1960, uh, or at least not lawfully, uh, uh, at the invitation of the Cuban government. But so that, that, that part of it is, is interesting. Um, I had uh, dinner with some, and I covered this so they can 
cover their ears if they want to, but, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. So beyond that, then one moves to two levels of speculation. One level of speculation is whether uh, the diplomats, the U.S. diplomats in Havana, made this up for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know all of the diplomats who had served in Havana, but I know a number. And what you get consistently from them is that the ability to reach uh, two dozen government-to-government -government agreements in the last two years of the Obama presidency was the high point of their careers, both because they felt they were serving the interests of the United States in the negotiations, and because in the context of the U.S. government, they were able to work not just with fellow diplomats, but with others in um, uh, the Department of Defense and the Coast Guard and, and the like who were necessarily a part, a lot of the agreements were on security issues, law enforcement and the like. So they are not likely to have made it up. Uh, again, I don't know all the Cuban diplomats who dealt on the Cuban side, but they say almost the same words. For them, this was the high point of their careers. Just as for Obama and Raul Castro, this was a real plus in the way that they were governed. So I have the predisposition to believe that neither the, of the two presidents nor government officials who were working with them uh, made this up. So the diplomats really were injured. Uh, they did not make it up. This was not authorized by either government. That then takes you to the realm of wild speculation as opposed to just some speculation, which is, okay, who might have done it? So in response to the Obama initiatives, it was the first time that the Cuban leadership gave evidence in public that they had split. There had been differences uh, uh, before, but this was the first time in public that Fidel Castro chided his brother. He had not done this before uh, for the opening to the United States. It is therefore possible that there is a rogue group in Cuba, who decided, Fidel Castro dying or dead, uh, that this was a way to defend and advance Fidel's preferences, even after his death. That's one possibility. Second possibility, and, and the idea is to sabotage U.S.-Cuban relations. Second possibility, who else might be interested in sabotaging U.S.-Cuban relations? Well, perhaps someone in the Cuban-American community in the United States mainly in Southern Florida. Third possibility, an all-purpose uh, uh, possibility to accuse is the Russian government, uh, which also may have wanted to sabotage a, a successful initiative that the U.S. Uh, government had undertaken. Uh, for, the, for that to happen, though, you probably would need also, not instead of, but also, some rogue group in Cuba where the Russian government or some agency in the Russian government would provide the technology, whatever the technology was, and the Cubans would implement it. But so I said, the short answer is no. <laughs> to keep these people in such poor conditions and, and under their thumb, I assume this is a police state that people perform on their neighbors, Etc. Or is that not true? Right. So the question, uh, uh, just to repeat it, you know, to what extent is this a police state? So one thing that it is not, and I ordinarily associate with the expression police state, uh, is you know tanks in the street, artillery in the corner. It's not that. Um, what what the government developed in the early 1960s. Uh, is a network uh, called Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. And these are neighbors who are indeed supposed to watch over the neighborhood and report to um, uh, state security uh, anything that is uh, suspicious or, or in violation of established uh, regulations and, and procedures. And that is a significant element of uh, control. Um, it is, sorry? They're paid. No, no, they're not paid. These are volunteers. Um, 
And remember, if they were paid, given the Cuban salary structure, you're not talking about a fortune. Uh, the, what they do get, and it is a different kind of currency, um, uh, is promotion possibilities. So I demonstrate by reporting you to state security that I am a loyal revolutionary. And the next time someone is looking for a loyal revolutionary for a job more significant than the one I now have, assuming I do have some other qualifications, uh, that is part of your uh, work biography. The, the government keeps uh, a, uh, in a sense, a biography of not only work, but civic engagement, political memberships, uh, on everyone. It is, it is the established record, and that is how you would, where it would be recorded that you have provided a valuable service. So this network of informants is, in fact, one of the procedures. Uh, the arrests, I made a reference to uh, an arrest um, average between 500 and 1,000 people per month. Uh, the, the main goal of that is deterrent. Uh, you don't want to arrest too many people, but you want to make sure that others who might be tempted to join the same group marching or the same group discussing do not do so because it's not particularly pleasant to be arrested. So that's another feature. Bearing in mind that it is a country where the government owns and operates all the mass media, uh, meaning you know, television, radio, uh, it operates an intranet, it blocks access to internet sites that it dislikes. The only kind of media not, entire, not, not under the control of the government are uh, publications from communities of faith. Uh, and, uh, you know, those proceed cautiously. Uh, there, so there are a couple of reasonably independent magazines, but the adverb reasonably has to be used because it's not a, not a free-for-all. So there is the network of informants. There are these other means as well. Um, the, the tourists are watched, it's the responsibility of the place where you're staying to keep watch on you. And that is an obligation. Um, Airbnb looks the other way. Because it's the same responsibility for a bed and breakfast as it would be for an international hotel chain. One of which is shared. So it is their responsibility of the staff to, not, not of hotel management, but of the staff to provide this, what's word in Spanish is vigilancia, vigilance. Other? Um, given the fact that apparently uh, America's involvement with Cuba is going to decline over the next four years, uh, could you tell us what kind of economic activity uh, is coming from Europe and other uh, advanced countries other than the United States in terms of the future? So the main, uh, um, just to step back to pick up a couple of things from my, from my remarks, uh, Cuba exports relatively few goods. The main thing that it exports is services. Uh, thus, the principal relationship with Western European countries and Canada uh, has become tourism. Uh, and that is uh, strong and vibrant. Uh, it has continued to grow uh, independent of any decisions that the Trump administration may have taken. Um, it will probably not grow sufficiently fast to replace what appears to be a significant drop in the number of visitors from the United States, which is why those in the still small Cuban private sector are worried because they, they really do depend on, on, on this business. Tourists from Canada and Western Europe uh, tend to go to the beach. Canadians in particular fly from Montreal and Toronto to Varadero Beach, which is Cuba's premier resort. By doing that, uh, they tend to stay in state hotels and eat at state cafeterias. The U.S. rules, th these rules are no different under Trump than under Obama. They've been the rules now for a while. 
Um, you can go to Cuba with an alumni association. You can go to Cuba with a Museum of Fine Arts. Just don't go to the beach. That's the one thing under Obama as well as now we're prohibited from doing. But that means we go to Havana, which is a very interesting city. And we stay at Airbnbs. And we eat at the private restaurants, not at the state cafeteria. So these policies that at one level are restrictive of the flow of people between the U.S. and Cuba have been a godsend for the private sector in metropolitan Havana. And so even if the Europeans and the Canadians keep coming, they're going to go to the beaches where there are very few private businesses, and that's why those who I know in Havana are concerned. The, in, with regard to Spain also has a significant business in high quality Cuban cigars. Um, Canada has a significant business with regard to high quality Cuban rum. Um, but but the, those are, Cuba uses sugar mainly to pay um, for imports from the People's Republic of China and um, uh, Middle East, uh, Arab countries in the Middle East uh, and, and the like. So it's, it's, it's fairly limited. The export of professional services doesn't go to Europe and Canada. That really is um, uh, developing countries. Yeah. Another? Uh, yes. Um, because of the lack of uh, availability of medicine in Cuba for the last 50 years, yes. I understand that Cuba has developed their own pharmaceutical sort of a industry? Yes. So uh, Cuba does have a very severe shortage of medicines. It's, it still does. Um, it has a, and it's slightly paradoxical because it, it, as I've said, it, it does have a good healthcare system. The healthcare system has emphasized prevention, at least in part, because the supply of medicine is, uh, insufficient prescription medicine in particular. Um, this issue gets reported on occasionally now. This is another small political change in the Cuban press uh, where they say, you know, the city of whatever it is has not had um, aspirin or Tylenol or that for weeks now. Uh, the biggest and the uh, news item that might have I not surprised you, uh, but it really sort of the largest public scandal related to the availability of things related to one's personal health and well, well-being is the absence of condoms for six months uh, in one in Cuba's third largest city. This was a real crisis. Uh, so Cuba did develop, has developed the biotechnology sector, which is probably what you have in mind. Uh, it began to develop in the 1980s. Uh, on the problematic side, Cuba has never published any data on what has this cost. So Cuba now exports, some of the goods that it exports are biotechnology products, pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, but it is very difficult to, which, you know, that's great, that's fine. And, and they, they work and they're good. And, but it is as a business proposition, I cannot tell you if that's a good business or a bad business, because I don't know how they invest it. Um, so that's one problem. They, I am not um, um, sufficiently knowledgeable to assess the quality of biotechnology. There is a market test where they export, they keep putting orders. Uh, there is the, the market test includes the complaint that the supplies are not reliable, sometimes they arrive, sometimes they don't. Again, the closer you get to the economy, the closer you get to business, the less well they do. The closer you are to higher education to science, in this case applied science, the better they are. I'll tell you my one anecdote touring the biotechnology. My colleagues at Harvard who have visited uh, do vouch that the applied science, it's applied science, but, but that it is very good. Time that I visited um, was um, uh, end of the Cold War, late 1980s. Uh, and as I was walking around, there were all of these bulletin boards with uh, announcements of a seminar to be conducted in English. And so I said, you know, who is coming from Canada or the United Kingdom or perhaps the United States for the seminar? No, no, that's an internal seminar, uh, they said. What do you mean an internal seminar? 
Yes, the language of science is English. We're scientists. We speak English to each other. Slightly devilishly, I then said, oh, do you also have seminars in Russian? So the Soviet Union was still on. The Soviet Union was massively subsidizing all Cuban activities. And he paused and sort of looked around and said, no, no, we provide the Soviets with technical assistance in biotechnology. <laughs> they, they were good. One final question. First of all, thank you for the excellent presentation. One question, uh, how do you see the possibility to rebuild the sugar business, in particular refineries, and knowing that technology is pretty high and lots of engineers, right. qualified ones? Right, so um, reviving the old sugar mills uh, is difficult. Um, the, of the 161 sugar mills at the moment that the Cuban government, it's not declaring bankruptcy in the way that we would be familiar with in the United States. It's just simply shutting them down. Um, the time they reached that decision, of the 161, I think only 10 had been built after 1930. So these are sugar mills uh, built uh, disproportionately by U.S. companies in the first quarter of the 20th century and Spanish immigrants who also came at about that time. And they, they were uh, uh, highly productive and they were maintained over time and they were maintained during the period after 1959 as well. Uh, just as they're good at repairing 1955 Chevys, they're good at repairing uh, 1917 sugar mills. Uh, I attended at one point, uh, this is now about 15 years ago, the 100th anniversary of a locomotive that was put into service and was still working. Uh, so yeah, it's this kind of antiquarian paradise. So to put those back into work, wow, that is pretty difficult. Um, and so uh, the question is, you know, there's still a workforce that knows how uh, to grow sugarcane, uh, knows how to uh, work with sugar mills and sugar refineries. Uh, there are still, you know, professionals who know about the chemistry of the process of uh, um, extracting uh, from the cane itself the varieties of products. There clearly is good technology in sugar agribusiness in Australia and in Brazil. Uh, all of that, um, in, in fact, would be a very good investment, but it really requires a company that knows what it's doing to come from the outside. I, I think for almost anything in Cuban agriculture that has been attempted by Sten Enterprises has failed. And uh, some of the reasons for the failure were idiosyncratic. Fidel thought he knew a lot about agriculture, which happened not to be true, and therefore lots of mistakes came. You know, can you grow rice in a swamp? Well, no, not particularly well. That was one of his big projects, so, you know, not, not, not this kind of thing. Um, and they're not yet ready to welcome that kind of foreign investment. The kind of foreign investment they've been welcoming is primarily in various forms of manufacturing outside agriculture. Uh, and it is striking, one can, you know, go around. I, I, I mentioned one of the reforms is to allow agricultural workers on state farms to grow their own farm. Um, that's because they had identified that about a million hectares, it's a lot of land, a million hectares of Cuba's agricultural land had been uncultivated. Well, today, 900,000 hectares of Cuban agricultural lands are still uncultivated. Uh, they, 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 they're just, that's a sector they're just not good at. They're great at training physicians and nurses. They're not good at growing food or sugarcane. Dr. Dominguez, thank you so much. Thank you.